I can stand here every Wednesday or Sunday or whenever we're here. I can lead a worship song. I can raise my hands. I can sing out to God. But if there's no change in my heart, what's the use? What's the use? Tonight's message is called Don't Rebuild Jericho. And you may have heard the uh, story about Jericho. You may have heard the battle at Jericho. You may have heard of the walls that came tumbling down. You may have even have heard of the Elvis Presley song. Joshua, the jail of Jericho, Jericho, you know, and the walls came tumbling down, hey, 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 you know. And uh, so he did that. That's one of my mom's favorite songs because she loves Elvis, Elvis Presley. She thought he was a hoot. So, um, yeah, you've heard all of that story, and you've probably heard it told uh, about the you know story of Jericho being a story of having faith and not giving up. And that's true. They did exactly what God told them, and look what happened. The walls came tumbling down. But I have a slightly different perspective to bring tonight about Jericho. And I will read the entire chapter of uh, Joshua 6. And then we will get into some other scripture to connect it all together. Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us, everything that you do for us, and everything that you will do for us. You are so holy and righteous, and I praise your holy name for who you are and for everything that you give us because you give us good gifts, Father. We thank you so much for that. I pray that you will speak to us through your word and that we will be changed by the renewing of our mind tonight in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. So tonight uh, we will be reading through the first uh, or the whole chapter of six, uh, chapter six of Joshua. And before we do that, I want to let you guys know an interesting thing about the name Joshua. The name Joshua comes from the original term, which is Yeheshua. And Yeheshua is the name in Hebrew that Jesus would have been spoken about by his own mother. It would have been Yeshua. Not Jesus. Jesus is a Greek term. It's a Greek word from that name, same name, just a Greek word that became English, just as Jesus is Spanish and others are similar sounds to it. But the original way that Mary would have said, Come here, son, she would have said, Yeshua. And it's beautiful because the name Joshua means salvation. But his name wouldn't have been Joshua back then. We wouldn't have said, hey, Joshua. We would have said, Yeshua, or whatever, however you would say hello in Hebrew. I didn't look that up, so I don't know. But it would have been Yeshua. They would have called him by that name. His name means salvation. And it is very important to this story because it is not Moses who brought anyone into the promised land. It was salvation that brought them into the promised land. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all of its warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then 
the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. There's historical artifacts backing this up as well, which they hadn't found for so long. So Joshua called together the priests and said, take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of, e uh, in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, march around the town and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the, of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and some behind the ark with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do not shout. Do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout. Then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the arms, with the ram's horns, marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the army men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priest sounded the long blast of the horns, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed. Remember that word, completely destroyed. As an offering to the Lord, only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Earlier on, Rahab had protected their spies, and she was a prostitute. However, the Lord said that she would not be harmed, and she wasn't. It's interesting how sometimes church theology messes up with what God actually does. Because God said, no, you spare this prostitute. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed. Again, do not take any of these things that are set apart for destruction, or you yourself will be completely destroyed. And you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Mm. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into the treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and they captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords. Men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats, and donkeys. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. The men who had been spies went and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. They burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua invoked a curse. May the curse of the Lord fall on anyone who tries to rebuild the town of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. 
at the cost of his youngest son, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his reputation spread throughout the land. Hallelujah. Now, I want to go back to verse 18 real quick. Refresh our minds a second here. It says, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourself will be completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. Now, Joshua, as I said earlier, he led the Israelites into the promised land. Moses did not. Moses did something that the Lord said not to do. Because of that, he was disciplined not to enter the promised land. But Joshua did enter the promised land. And Joshua entering the prom promised land is significant because God didn't have Joshua do this to just Jericho. There were many cities that this happened to. But I want to just focus on one. Because this could take a very long series to look through all of them. But this one right here is the start. The promised land represents the place where God resides. It is holy. It is promised. It is blessed. It is claimed for. For his people. And in this day that we live in, there is a place that is promised. There is a land that is blessed where God resides. And it is called the temple. Us. And since we are blessed, since we have God residing in us, we need to do the same thing that Joshua did to Jericho. Jericho was a filthy, nasty, dirty town full of things that were not of God. And so anything in our life that is not of God, we must destroy it. We must destroy it. In 2 Kings, it talks about, actually, I'm sorry, 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. It says, it was during the reign that Hael, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid the foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son. And when he completed it and he set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son. This all happened be according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. See, this is significant in our lesson tonight. Because there was a promise told, and that promise was that people would enter the promised land, but things had to happen. Things had to change, and Joshua was the man to do it. Remember, Joshua means salvation. And so when the Lord told Joshua to destroy this city, 
It is similar in the way that the Lord wants us to destroy things in our life as well. If you turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, there's an interesting scripture. And Paul, of course, is talking to the church. He's not talking to an unbeliever. He's explaining something to the church. And he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. No need if keeping the law was all it took. After becoming victorious and leading the people into the promised land, Joshua decided in his heart to dedicate all of Jericho's plunder, its silver, its gold, its bronze, and its iron, to God. These things were sacred to the Lord, and it was Joshua's conviction to put God first and to honor him with all of the treasure. Jesus died and spilled his blood to redeem us. We were bought with the most precious, the most expensive monetary value that the world will ever see. There's nothing more precious, more valuable than Jesus and the blood that he spilled for us shows how much he thinks we are worth. We are worth so much more than what the world says or what that we might say of ourselves. We are worth so much more. But we also need not make it as though Christ died for nothing. We must not make it about that. Because when we do that, it's as if we're saying, thanks but no thanks. Yeah, I'm glad that you did it, but I'll still do what I want. No big deal. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Why? Because of all he has done for you. That's why. All that he's done for you. Let your body be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. This is actually the true way that you worship him. I can stand here every Wednesday or Sunday or whenever we're here. I can lead a worship song. I can raise my hands. I can sing out to God. But if there's no change in my heart, What's the use? What's the use? That's why I did what I did tonight. For his glory. For us to all be given a moment to be ministered to. 
to let the Lord just pour into us. Because I will tell you this, listening to the word is good. But good old James said something important. Do not be a listener of the word only, but be a doer. Because if you are only a listener, you're sabotaging yourself. You're deceiving your own life. And that's destructive. Because that can get us to a place where we have forgotten our first true love. We need to be as close to this cross as we can be. Not that physical one, but the spiritual aspect of the cross. The death, the resurrection, the power, the blood, the love, the holiness, the righteousness of Christ. And the more that we say to ourselves, it's okay, maybe later, it's okay, maybe later, the further we get away from the truth of the purity, of the simplistic nature of what it takes to really just getting to know the Father. It's not difficult to know the one who wrote us the letters by which we get to know him. It's not like he's hiding in a box saying, try and come find me. He has laid it out in thousands of words in scripture, inspired by his breath, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 says, do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. No, I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm not sure if God's saying this or saying that. Well, don't be conformed to the world, number one. Don't let the world have any influence in your life. And when you do that, when you let the noise go, you will see clear what's in front of you. When a quarterback for a football team hikes the ball and he's holding it and he's looking the field over, he knows someone is coming to tackle him and going to hit him hard. And if he looks, if he glances, if he takes his eye off his receiver for one moment, it could be an interception, an incompletion, a fumble, mess the whole thing up. But if he's focused... And he's determined. And he says, I don't care what comes my way. I'm going to get this where it needs to go. Then he will zip it. And his accuracy will hit his target. And it will do its job. Whether or not he is inflicted with pain. Whether or not he has something happening to him. As a Christian, the world will bring us troubles trials, aggravations, frustrations. But don't be conformed to the behaviors and customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. How can we change the way we think? We do that by reading the word of God, by spending more time in prayer. I'm as guilty as anyone about being on this instead of being like this.
and we wonder why we can't win anything in our country. We wonder why we can't win anything in our life battles. We wonder why we can't seem to break through. Joshua was devoted and dedicated to walking around that city. He was devoted and dedicated to destroy that nasty thing which should not be in the promised land. He was so dedicated that he said, we'll do it every single day as long as it takes, Lord. We're going to go march. We're going to praise your name. We're going to give you glory. We're going to give you honor. We're going to pray. We're going to be steadfast. We are going to be true to your word. We are going to keep your word. We know that your promises are sure and true, and they will not fail us, and we will see the walls break down in Jesus' name. And the same for us, that we keep on keeping on until we see the outcome. And even as Moses did not see the outcome, he still was steadfast knowing that his God was the God of the universe. We will not always see the end through everything. But it is the determination, it is the factor of our heart. One of my favorite Bible verses. From the overflow of the heart, your mouth will speak. We have to guard our heart. We have to guard this temple that God resides in. How amazing is it that the king of the universe, the creator of all, would say, I am going to dwell in a dirty, wretched piece of dirt. And yet at the same time, that dirty piece of dirt was who God said, look, we will make them in our own image. He loves us that much that he would make us in his own image. He didn't have to. He chose to. To make us in his own image. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, Starting in verse 16. Lord Jesus, help me have the words. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You see, the sinful nature in us is like that city of Jericho. And there's a portion of us that craves it. We crave that little part, whatever it is that, that you know, it, it's, in, it, it's, it's, it's yours. And you, you, you're like, oh, it's, it's been in my life for so long. Or, or it's something that rears its ugly head every once in a while. And I, I've been dealing with it, and I think it's gone, and then I deal with it again. It, it comes in waves. <sighs> but we can't go back to it. We can't rebuild it. Because when we rebuild it, it's a curse. Sin is a curse. And if we go back and rebuild the area of sin that we have had destroyed and we've become free from in the name of Jesus, it's not good. It'll torment us. It can make you sick, even physically. It can get you to a place to where you just don't feel good. Maybe it brings depression or anxiety or fear. It could bring something in that, that you don't want. 
We, we need to keep renewing our mind in the Holy Spirit, in the Word of God, in prayer on a daily basis so those things that which were crushed, that were demolished, that were destroyed, that we don't bring some cement or some bricks and start, sh you know, uh, slacking it back up there and just build another little portion of it. No, we need to keep it in crumbles. We need to keep it burnt. We need to keep it in, in, in ashes and dust never to come back again. Because you know why verse 17 says the sinful, sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But, hallelujah for that but. Amen. That three-letter word is powerful right here. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of of Moses. Amen. When you are directed by the Holy Spirit, that means that we are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. What does the law of Moses represent? It represents not being in the promised land. It represents not being good enough. It represents not being able to overcome. It represents not being able to do the things that God has called us to do. But when we are directed by the Holy Spirit, that means that Jesus lives inside of us. That means that we have the salvation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that means we can storm into the promised land and we can say not today Satan we can destroy the cities that are trying to cause problems in our life we can destroy the sin by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ for we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony in Jesus name when you follow the desires of your sinful nature the results are very clear very clear. Sexual immorality. How much do we see of that in this country alone, let, let alone the world today? Impurity. Lustful pleasures. I'm going to skip a word and come back to it. Sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, back to one word that I skipped over because it's a word that I think we don't realize is more prevalent in our society than it ever before. Idolatry. Idolatry. Oh, but I don't have a big idol. I don't have this big graven image that I go hooba da hubba da hiba da hooba da hooba da hubba da hiba da. I don't do that. No, idolatry. If anything is in our life that we put before the Lord, we are giving it our worship. We are giving it our praise instead of the God of the universe who created us, who breathed life into us. Idolatry can be this. Idolatry can be TV shows. Idolatry can be being so obsessed with your children. Overwhelmingly obsessed with worry and anxiety about every little thing that they're going to do. I can't tell you how much peace I saw, and I'm so glad I saw it before she died. Before my mom died, she had a peace, and it was a lot because of Miss Linda. Because Miss Linda gave her some words of advice and gave her words of wisdom and prayed with her over and over about it. And I tried, and she finally did it, and you could see a night and day difference because she worried so much about her children. And then one day she said, uh-uh, I'm going to put it in this box. I'm going to leave it over here, and it's going to be God's forever. I'm done with worrying and you should see the peace that came upon her heart that is what 
God wants for us. He does not want us to be living a life of bondage. He wants us free because who the sun sets free is free indeed. So idolatry can be so many things. Anything that we allow to become so consumed, so important in our life that our walk with the one who created it all becomes less significant. I want the fire and desire in my heart again like I did when I first knew who Jesus was, when I first knew what salvation meant, when I first knew what deliverance meant, when I first knew what it meant to have the Holy Spirit power and authority to walk in that every day. I want that fire again. I want that excitement. I want that emotion and passion back in my life every single day. For Jesus, nothing else matters. I'm following after the cross. I'm not following after the world. Amen. But the Holy Spirit, verse 22, produces the kind of fruit in our lives that is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And a, there is no law against these things. There is no law against these things. There is no hindrance to the promises of God when we have the Holy Spirit bringing things into us. There is no hindrance because we have the salvation of the world living in us. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to not our cross his cross and crucified them there not our cross it was supposed to be our cross and he took it that's amazing our God is so good Since we are living by the Spirit, then what should we do? Well, I, I mean, what should I do then if I'm living by the Spirit? Well, the Word of God says it right there. This is not from Pastor Kelly. This is not Miss Linda's version. This is the Word of God saying, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every, every, every area of our lives. That's why Jericho was supposed to be destroyed. That's why Jesus, or God didn't say to Joshua, he didn't say, go and destroy most of Jericho. Go on ahead and leave that part over there because I know you kind of like to have a little fun. So go on ahead and keep that part, but leave everything in, in shambles other than that, okay? No, he said, destroy it all. I want this for myself because I'm worthy of it. But everything else, you destroy it, get rid of it, and don't you dare rebuild it because if you rebuild it, it's going to bring something worse upon you. And I don't want that for you. I'm trying to protect my people. That's what God is saying in our lives today, every day. The word of God is here for us, for us to eat and for us to eat and for us to eat so that we can be consumed by it, so that we can be nourished by it, so that we can be overwhelmed by it, so that we can live it out and that we can become what Jesus wants. And that is a reflection of the sun in a dark, dark world world. That is what it's about. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. You know why it says that so blatantly? Because jealousy is straight from the devil. Because James 3, 16, one of my favorite Bible verses, everybody knows John 3, 16, but his brother over here had a really good one too. James 3, 16. Does anybody know it? It's a good verse. I love it. Where you find jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find evil of every kind. And I wasn't going to bring this up, but now I'm going to real quick before I close. 
Satan. In the book of Ezekiel, it speaks about Satan and how he was dressed in beautiful gemstones. Beautiful creature. It actually says that he was the perfection, perfection of beauty. That is a strong word to use by God. To call Satan, Lucifer, the one against it all. The perfection of beauty. And I can just see Lucifer, this gorgeous, beautiful, holy angel up in heaven, adorned in perfection, literally. Worship leader, hallelujah. I got you. No problem, Jesus. Wait a second. I'm perfect. I'm like the apple of God's eye. I'm everything. I'm all that in a bag of chips, you know? You know what? I deserve to be worshipped. Look at me. Perfect in beauty. That's me, Lucifer. Yeah. And so because of that, God says, no bueno, <laughs> not going to happen. And he falls to the earth like lightning. And it becomes his kingdom. And he knows his end. But interestingly enough, God does something, I think, that makes Satan even more mad. Because at the time, God decides to make mankind out of dirt. And he calls us his image. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, so, so you're saying that I'm the perfection of beauty. I'm all that in a bag of chips. But now you've just made something that, that they don't have no power over me. Look at me. Look at me. I got wings. I'm, I'm, I am just, I'm all over the place. I've got all this power. I've got all of this greatness in me. You're going to make something out of this dirt. It's, it's feeble. It's weak. It has nothing on me. And you're going to call it your image? I'll show you your image. I will twist the word of God to confuse them and make them become more like me and less like you. I will make them hate you. I will make them not even believe in you. Watch me. And that's what he's done. And that is why we are not to become conceited, provoke one another. This is the church he's talking about. Or be jealous of one another. We are to take our sinful desires and keep them crucified at his cross. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Jesus fought the battle for you and me. And the walls came tumbling down. Think about it. Jesus destroyed the power of sin in the grave. And that stone rolled away. And Jesus says, please leave it behind. Don't rebuild it. Don't rebuild what I've destroyed. It's for your own good. Please, come into the promised land. Come into your own, what I've called you to, what I have a will in, in, my, in your life for, everything that I have planned for you. Come into it. Come into it. And keep away from what has already been destroyed. But just like the king we have the choice. He was in the promised land and he chose to rebuild and it cost him. I'm not saying that it would cost you your salvation, but I am saying take a deeper look because we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. And even if it does not cost our salvation, Paul says very clearly, should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? May it never be. It's not 
a credit card for us to just keep using, keep using, telling ourselves over and over it's okay because. No. God's call for each and every one of us before anything else, before evangelism or before uh, being a preacher or being uh, before getting anyone saved in your life even, you and I have to be right. Because if we try to do something and we're not in the power of God when we're doing it, or if we try to do something and we mess up and do it the wrong way or we show our butt in some sort of way to somebody who does not know the Lord, it could be the eternal damnation difference for their soul. And that would be on us. It's a serious, serious thing to be called a child of God. And we are to take it seriously, knowing that our king wants us to represent him to the best of our ability. Because we've already had the victory. Joshua already stormed Jericho. Jesus already defeated hell in the grave. <laughs>